Welcome to BDA's Dyslexia Awareness Week 2018. Um, this session is for adults and employers and is Winning Wednesday. So the focus of this session is on the dyslexia-friendly environment. What do we mean when we talk about a dyslexia-friendly employer? A dyslexia-friendly employer makes significant commitments to becoming somebody who values the differences that employees bring to the workplace. They can do this by focusing on these areas, culture, and ensuring that the culture fosters um, the notion of valuing diversity by raising awareness, by implementing practical and reasonable adjustments, by utilizing computers and assistive technology, by ensuring that individuals can access assessment and support, and also generally saying no to failure and ensuring that individuals within the workplace can be successful and achieve their potential. So what do we mean by culture? For some organizations, changing the culture can be particularly challenging. And I think one of the approaches to this is really a, a top-down, bottom-up approach. So firstly, there needs to be a commitment from senior managers within the organization that there needs to be a change. And as such, it's important to define the culture that you want and the changes that are required. It's only by having that management commitment that the changes are likely to be seen as being important and therefore permeate through the whole organization. It's important then to communicate and reinforce the messages that there is a consistent buy-in from everybody across all levels of the organization. And that may mean that in some cases that you have to persuade and sell the benefits of this new culture. It can also be very important to recruit champions um, of, the new, of these ideas. Developing dyslexia networks or neurodiversity networks can really start to push out the, the whole concept of this across an organization and engaging with individuals right the way through the organization starts to embed the changes in the culture and also to put things on the agenda that it becomes an issue that is easily discussed um, and accessible for all within an organization and then most importantly i suppose to monitor or review things as they move forward it may be that within the process things need to be tweaked or changes and certainly there will be the need to assess how the progress um, with the culture change is going. So what do we mean by talking about awareness? So awareness of dyslexia, and this can be achieved through training. Um, the BDA has a whole raft of easily accessible training materials available either through face-to-face -face sessions or through e-learning, um, or we can actually do bespoke training sessions to meet the needs of your particular business. Training is important, not just because it's the giving of information, but also because it starts to reinforce those cultural changes and raise awareness. Many organizations have found the benefits of developing dyslexia support networks or forums internally. These give um, individuals within that organization a clear forum or a place to get together and discuss the issues that they are facing. And it gives them a, a voice and a channel through to decision makers in the um, organization who can then act upon um, the information that they're giving. Important also to include information about dyslexia and neurodiversity within company documents, such as staff handbooks or induction materials. In this way, it sends a clear message both for staff who are new, new starters and for existing staff that this is something that there is a commitment to. The BDA also recently launched its Dyslexia Smart Awards. The purpose of these awards was to enable organizations to make a commitment to becoming dyslexia aware um, by developing and implementing a, a training strategy, um, by ensuring that communications were dyslexia friendly, and also by developing an action plan to move forward with these things. So we're not assuming that you're going to have everything in place immediately, but what we were looking for within these awards is a commitment to moving towards becoming dyslexia friendly. If this is something that you'd be interested in, um, then please drop us a line and we'd be delighted to speak to you about it. Another area.
area where there's been great success are dyslexia champions. Um, this is something that's been developed by a good friend of ours at the BDA, Jeanette Beetham, and she's developed a whole strategy and process for training and developing individuals within organizations to be dyslexia champions. So these are individuals who have a basic knowledge of um, dyslexia where colleagues um, can go and talk to them and they will receive really good quality information and signpost them to further sources of information. So whilst they're not necessarily dyslexia experts, um, they have a greater level of awareness and knowledge and can provide adv advice and signpost to other sources of information and next steps. Having dyslexia champions within an organization is, means that there is a, a visual um, named recognition of individuals that um, have this sort of, if you like, banner. Um, so it makes the dyslexia far more visible with a clear go-to for individuals who want to find out more or need further information. Within sort of this area of, of developing good practice, reasonable adjustments are very important. Small adjustments can make a big difference. I think there is a fear sometimes by employers that reasonable adjustments are going to be huge and that they are going to be hugely disruptive to the business as a whole. Reasonable adjustments can be relatively small, but equally can have a very big impact on the performance of an individual or indeed the culture and performance of an organization. But reasonable adjustments are just that, they are reasonable. And the decision as to whether something is reasonable or not will depend on a whole host of factors, such as the size of an organization, the resources it has available, and the nature of the role being adjusted. So in some cases, it may not be possible to make reasonable adjustments, and it certainly wouldn't be possible to reasonable adjust a role, reasonably adjust a role so it is no longer the role that somebody is employed to do. So the key here is on, on it being reasonable. But as I said, being reasonable and having small adjustments can make a very significant difference to individuals. And there is funding available through um, the government scheme Access to Work to support organizations to implement reasonable adjustments. So this is not something where an, an organization has to carry the entire burden of the cost. Examples of reasonable adjustments can be very simple. So for example, um, access to a suitable working area, such as a quiet zone. So where somebody struggles to filter out background noise or they really need to concentrate on a particular piece of work, um, facilitating, facilitating areas such as quiet zones can be really effective. Flexible working where possible. So this might mean allowing the individual to take control of um, what work they do when to suit sort of their patterns of work throughout the day, where they're feeling more focused and more energized, they can do the more challenging work, and um, where they need sort of a bit of downish time, they can do the less challenging work. So flexible working is always a good thing. Um, simple things like providing information in advance for meetings and training enables the individual to kind of get prepared for the meeting and by doing that it's likely that the input that they have into meetings is likely to be far more effective and informed. Using the dyslexia friendly style guide is just a general tool that ensures that written information and web-based information is accessible. So ensuring that um, information meets the style guide ensures accessibility for, for a whole range of individuals, not just our dyslexic individuals. Um, it may be, for example, that somebody needs specific support for specific skills, for example, um, time management, planning and organizing complex documents. Um, all of those sorts of things can be supported through access to work funding for specific work skills coaching. One of the things I think that we're all quite guilty of now is with emails is doing a, a copying in huge numbers of people or forwarding on um, massive documents for individuals to read. 
sometimes something as simple as highlighting the important or relevant points in documents can save everybody a huge amount of time and make everybody efficient. Um, why would we send somebody, you know, a massive 40-page document when it's actually only, you know, paragraph two on page four that is relevant to them? So simply highlighting important points in documents or highlighting specifically the action that you require somebody to do, again, leads to greater efficiency. Explicitly prioritizing information or instructions that the individual needs to action. Um, if we're clear in the information that we give and what is required, then it makes it a lot more straightforward for individuals to, to meet our expectations in terms of their actions. If we give vague and, and disorganized instructions, then it's likely that we will have vague and disorganized actions. Um, setting clear targets and time frames. So sometimes we set a piece of work and we have in our mind what we expect it to take in terms of time, but sometimes it would be better to convey that to the people who are also carrying out the work, provided of course it is um, realistic in our expectations. Likewise, using assistive technology can make a, a massive difference to individuals. Um, and we had a webinar on that from one of our assistive technology experts on Tuesday, which will be available in the BDA shop if you missed it. Now, what you might also notice here with these examples of reasonable adjustments is that actually a lot of these things are relevant for individuals who are not dyslexic. And this is really one of the key benefits of being dyslexia friendly. What works for dyslexia is also beneficial for everybody in the workplace. So effectively, it's a win-win all round. I mentioned before the style guide. And the style guide is available on our website for people to download. But a simplified sort of basic version of the key points of it are use clear language. I think we're all guilty these days of using jargon and acronyms. Um, it's always worth asking yourself, if somebody was looking at this who had no knowledge of our organization, would they be able to understand it? Would it be clear? So get rid of the jargon. We always suggest something like Arial font or a sans serif font with a minimum of size 12, ideally 14, um, particularly with some of the smaller fonts but certainly a minimum of size 12, and one of the sort of sans serif fonts. Um, chunk up ideas. Make it clear where one point starts and one point stops. Use spacing for this, or bullet points. Please don't use italics, and certainly please don't write exclusively in capital letters. It makes it really difficult for people to read, particularly those who struggle um, visually. It makes all the words blur together and swim around. Um, if information needs to be highlighted or if it's particularly important, use bold instead. Um, try and use color as well to sort of differentiate different points within a document. Um, it can really make things stand out and again make it clear, particularly on things like PowerPoints where one point starts and another point stops. Use images if possible or diagrams. It's far easier to understand if there is a diagram or a flow chart rather than a great big long list of instructions. Um, people quite often ask us in terms of the background color. Um, if you want to sort of change the background color, cream is always a good bet. Um, try and avoid using black because it can sort of cause quite a lot of visual disturbance. So if you are going to use black, have a cream background, or if it's a white background, have a blue font, or ideal, use um, blue font on a cream background is quite nice as well. Um, anything that reduces the visual glare from um, text-based information can be really helpful. But as I said, the style guide in its entirety is on the BDA website, and there's a link to that at the end of this. We talk a lot about technology and assistive technology. And as I say, um, Abby James did a, a great webinar for us on this. So I'm not going to sort of go into great detail. But assistive technology has now moved on so much in recent times and can make a massive difference to individuals in the workplace. The sort of, I suppose, the, the categories of 
it really are text to speech so this is where um, the technology will read information out loud to an individual so this is really useful um, where individuals have to read a lot of information and um, understand it and comprehend it and assimilate it it can make things a lot easier and a lot more efficient and also for things like proofreading um, individuals quite often struggle to see their errors within text-based documents but if they can hear it being read out loud the errors become much more obvious um, speech recognition has certainly moved on in the last few years so being able to read it or talk into a computer can make a massive difference and again aid efficiency sometimes it takes a wee while for people to get used to this and obviously within a, a busy office environment we have to make sure that people have a suitable headset um, in, a, in order to be able to use both of those types of technology but once individuals have um, got to grips with it usually they find it a massive help one of the things with all of the technology though is to ensure that where it is being introduced um, individuals are able to have really good quality training on its use and how to use it effectively another area of technology is supporting of organization skills so being able to plan workflow use mind maps um, use graphic tools to support the writing process all of those can be really really useful there's a whole host of um, those sorts of software available um, and quite often it's down to the individual to, to find what works for them equally word processing um, there's most individuals find it much easier now to word process documents rather than handwrite and certainly typing gives you the whole raft of editing tools and spell checkers etc um, there are also some really effective software to, to support um, word processing skills um, that are available. So this just explains what text-to-speech does. So it supports reading and spelling skills and how it works is quite often that you highlight the text and it starts reading it to you. Um, it can also be used in exams if it is somebody's normal way of working. Um, and sometimes they, they require to have a, um, an exam access arrangement assessment in order to use it. One of the main benefits of um, text-to-speech software is that it also um, will read out um, spell checkers and the definitions of words which can really help with making sure that words are not um, mistakenly transposed or where people just click on the change button and, and kind of hope for the best. So certainly text-to-speech software is, is really, really helpful. And um, as it has there, there's lots of free software available um, to support that as well. So these are the usual ones that tend to be recommended within workplace needs assessment. So you've got Dragon, which is the um, voice recognition. Claro Read or Text Help is another one. Um, the picture there is of a reading pen as well. So that's a device that you use to scan over text and it reads it out loud. Um, individuals can actually use those in exams as well. Uh, there is a reading, an examination reading pen version. The LiveScribe pen um, is an amazing bit of kit and it does audio recording and will then also translate um, writing into um, text on a computer. Um, MindView, along with lots of other technology, has some really great workflow and project planning tools on it. So just the selection there, but lots of other things are available. So what do you do if you think you might be dyslexic, or indeed if you suspect that you have an employee who is dyslexic? The first thing to do is to have a conversation either with your line manager, uh, somebody from HR, or even with a colleague. Um, it's important that, that the conversation is started. Many individuals feel really anxious about disclosing um, their dyslexia because they feel that they may be sort of encounter um, discrimination or be thought less of. Um, so it's important to find somebody who you feel comfortable with 
to engage in that conversation. Um, we would always suggest as well to, to have that conversation when things are going well, um, where there's been sort of positive feedback given to kind of put that on the agenda at that time. It's also important within that discussion to talk about what works. So what works for, for the individual? What works for you? Um, what makes your life easier? What really makes your life more difficult? Um, raising those awareness means that people can adapt what they do very, very quickly and easily. And sometimes it's, it's unexpected things that lead to particular difficulties. In some cases, individuals might need a diagnostic or workplace needs assessment. A diagnostic assessment for dyslexia basically assesses the individual's profile of strengths and challenges and will provide a diagnosis of whether or not somebody is dyslexic. The key difference here is that it, this process is all about the identifying whether somebody is or is not dyslexic. And as the result of that, there will be within a report um, some generic recommendations of things that may or may not benefit that individual. Um, because at that time with a diagnostic assessment, the workplace won't have been explored or examined in, in detail, the recommendations within a diagnostic report tend to be quite generic. So they may well work within a workplace, but equally, some of them may not be appropriate for that individual's workplace. For a workplace um, recommendations, what an individual needs is a workplace needs assessment. So in this situation, the workplace needs assessor goes into the workplace to meet the individual. They will discuss with them the work that they do um, and the impact that their dyslexia has on them. They will also have a discussion with their line manager if they can, and they will observe the workplace. So they'll see exactly the environment, the sorts of things that, that need to be done, the tasks that are carried out. And on the basis of all of that information, along with reviewing the job description, they will then make specific recommendations for that individual in that specific workplace doing that specific role. And that's a key difference between the diagnostic assessment and the workplace needs assessment. The workplace needs assessment is all about the individual in that job doing that, that piece of work, those pieces of work. A diagnostic assessment is much more about whether or not somebody is or isn't dyslexic. So whilst they, the diagnostic assessment has recommendations in it, they tend to be more generic um, and because the workplace has not been specifically examined. You do not need to have a diagnostic assessment in order to have a workplace needs assessment. A workplace needs assessment is done on the basis of need. So if somebody needs support in a workplace, then they can go straight for a workplace needs assessment. The diagnostic assessment can, however, be really helpful because it gives information about that individual's profile of strengths and challenges. Um, so once the workplace needs assessment has been done, then it would be a question of implementing the changes. So these, as I said before, could be simple changes, low cost changes to the environment, to the work situation, um, the use of assistive technology and training to go with that, um, maybe some strategies training from a workplace coach. So all of those things can be put in place. But a key factor here is that these things are subject to ongoing review. Quite often, as somebody goes through this process, things will need to be tweaked and changed and, and further adjustments made. And we would normally say that it takes sort of six months for the benefits of, of adjustments to really be seen. But it is important to ensure that they are frequently reviewed and adjusted to see what's working, what's being effective, um, and, and sometimes what isn't. It can also be helpful as well to set up a network um, within your workplace. And as part of Dyslexia Awareness Week, you'll find the networking guide freely available to download on our website. Um, it's very useful for individuals to have a peer support group, um, a place where they can go and share experiences, and also to talk through particular issues and get different perspectives or different um, experiences of things that have 
worked for other people. So a support network can be really beneficial for people in work. Um, have some training in dyslexia for staff and managers. Um, there's, there's lots of training available through the BDA, um, either face-to-face -face training um, or indeed some e-learning modules that are easily accessible and very convenient to do. Encourage your organisation to sign up for the Dyslexia Smart Award. This shows a real commitment to becoming dyslexia aware and dyslexia friendly. Um, it explores how dyslexia information is disseminated within the organisation and action towards becoming um, dyslexia friendly. So it shows a real commitment. So for more information, there's lots of information for employers, individuals and parents on our website. Um, and also our Dyslexia Friendly Style Guide is available to download at that address. For further information, there is an absolute host of information on our website. Um, the BDA also operates a free helpline, which is available there, or you can email into the helpline. For training information, please contact our training department. Um, if if you're interested in finding more about assessments, um, then please email our assessments team um, or look on our assessments pages on our website. And for information on the SMART Awards and um, making that commitment to becoming dyslexia friendly, um, please contact Joanne and Gregory at that address there. So thank you very much for your time and I hope you found it useful.